Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church. You're watching us on YouTube right now. I hope you've been taking advantage of the daily Christmas December devotionals that we've been posting. I actually started on December 1st. So December 1st, decided I would go through the Christmas devotional that we gave out in church, just read a page of it every single day for you, and I'll continue to do that all the way up until December 25th. Thought we'd take a break uh, a little bit from Revelation. We've been doing uh, chapter by chapter Revelation study here on YouTube, but just felt maybe, maybe December wasn't the right month <laughs> to do a, a study on Revelation, but we'll pick that back up again in January of 2021. Our theme this year for Christmas is peace has come because, well, so far, 2020 has been anything but peaceful, right? And I think when we think about Christmas and perhaps some of the themes that we see at Christmas time, whether they be on a Christmas card or on a banner or in a storefront window, we see a lot of uh, printed words like joy, right? Or believe, cheer is a, is a popular one, Noel, okay? But in there, peace, we see peace as well. So where is it? Where is the peace? Because even Christmas time doesn't necessarily feel like a peaceful season or a peaceful time of year. So my message to you this December is peace has come. Not, not peace is coming and not that peace has come and then gone, but that peace has come, it's here, it's still here and it's not going anywhere. But it's still very hard to find, isn't it? We call this the Christmas season, or we call it the holiday, right? It's very ominous, the holiday. But with it comes the, all the dread of busyness. You start off with good intentions. You might have a well-drawn-up list. It's itemized. It's organized. But it doesn't mean you're going to get everything done, does it? Christmas makes us busy. And I think we end up drifting away from peace because we also then drift away from worship. We drift away from the spiritual. For some of us, the very first time we start thinking about Jesus or a manger is maybe at the kids' Christmas concert or maybe at the Christmas Eve service. So maybe there's, there's no peace in Christmas because our holiday doesn't begin with peace. No, it begins with busyness. And it begins with... Uh, just getting everything ready and drawing up a list and saying, okay, here's all the things we have to do. And then it ends with open boxes and wrapping paper everywhere. So I thought we'd look at the first Christmas story, but then when we did that, we noticed that there's not a lot of peace there either. And when we think about all the different characters that make up the Christmas story, we have the angels, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, the little drummer boy. My question today is, what about King Herod? He's not typically who we think of when we think of Christmas. He's, his picture is probably not on any Christmas cards. Who is Herod? Well, he was the king of the Jews when Jesus was born. King of the Jews, and he wasn't even Jewish. He was a very ambitious leader. He was a builder. He built port cities, he built aqueducts, he even built the Jewish temple. But being that ambitious and being that power hungry, it kind of got in his way a lot. He ended up betting on the wrong horse a lot and it really clouded his judgment. You remember Julius Caesar, right? Julius Caesar, 34 BC, uh, after the Senate killed him <laughs> and we had the whole et tu brute, right? His nephew Octavius and friend Mark Anthony, they avenged his death in the Roman Senate. Well, here comes King Herod. And Herod decides that between the powers that be, he's going to hitch his horse to Mark Antony. Seems like a good bet, right? So Herod used to send Mark Antony and Cleopatra gifts. And if they were close by or if they were nearby in town, he'd throw really big, huge, elaborate parties for them. 
That turned out to not be a really great idea because Octavius went to war with Mark Antony and Cleopatra and won. So Octavius became the very first emperor of Rome. So now, what does Herod do? I guess he can kill himself, right? Or he can run away. Or he can hope that maybe the new emperor forgets all about him and where his loyalties are. But Herod is ambitious. Herod is cunning. He's shrewd. He's ruthless. So he decides, I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to live in hiding. He got in a boat and he walked right into the throne room of Octavius and he apologized. This is the kind of guy Herod is. He's very politically astute. He's very power hungry and he's dedicated to his legacy. Dedicated to making sure that his name goes on and on and on. For instance, I'll give you, I'll give you some for instances about his legacy and about uh, how dedicated he was to his name continuing on after him. When his wife did not give him an heir, he remarried and then remarried and then remarried until he had 10 wives, 10 wives. I told you this guy doesn't make good decisions. And if and when he had sons and then his sons didn't live up to his expectations, he would go right back to his will and change his will. He'd say, forget that son. I now bequeath everything to this other son. And then if a rabbi came up to him and prophesied about maybe the, the doom and gloom that was off in his future, well, Herod didn't like that prophecy, so he would have that rabbi killed. Herod controlled the story as much as he could. He made up his own fame. He made up his greatness. So by the time we get to Christmas, Herod is now 70 years old and he's very sick. He's still hanging on. He's trying to ensure that if and when he dies, his legend will live on forever. And then in walks the three wise men. Matthew 2 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Herod is in his throne room when he gets the news. Hey, uh, you know, a couple miles down the road from you, we hear there's a new king. And the, and the people who in the, are in the courtroom with Herod, who hear this, they all, shh, he, he, doesn't like, he doesn't like news like this. And the wise men say, hey, we know we're, we know we're close by. We know he's in this area. Do you know where he would be? Do you know where we, how we could find him? Matthew 2 verse 3 says, when King Herod heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Yeah, you think? Because <laughs> if Herod is troubled, then we're troubled. You know, one time Herod made his 17-year-old brother-in-law high priest because he was worried about the current high priest. And then the next year, he had his brother-in-law drowned because he was worried about him. Another time, Herod was worried that his wife was so beautiful that she was probably unfaithful, and so he was going to have her killed. His wife found out about that, and she attempted to stop that from happening, so she stopped sleeping with him in bed. So Herod had her thrown in jail for it and tried. And then, because everyone was so afraid of him, Herod got his wife's own sister and his mother-in-law to lie on the witness stand. His wife was then executed, and then Herod executed the mother-in-law to keep her quiet. So yes, people are afraid of him. If Herod is troubled, we're all troubled. But the most fearful person in this story is Herod. Herod was afraid. Because when Herod heard that the baby would be the king of the Jews, we read about Herod's response. It says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. This news 
of Jesus' birth sent fear running through his heart. You know, Louis Pasteur, the great scientist, inventor, he had a fear of dirt, fear of germs, and he refused to shake hands with other people. President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison, who lived in the White House, they lived there when electricity was first installed. They were so scared of electricity, they would never touch the light switches. And if they were in a room where the lights were on and they couldn't find someone to turn the light switches off, they would go to bed with all the lights on. King Herod is insecure. He is fearing being on the losing side. He feared losing the throne. He feared being forgotten. I bet that out of all the characters in the Christmas story, you'd never find yourself identifying with Herod. But we all suffer from some sort of fear, don't we? We can have feelings of insecurity about our relationships, about our job. We can even have insecurities about where we stand with God. We fear what other people think about us. And, and, and we aren't secure with who we are. And that insecurity and that fear causes us to try to please others and, and, and to not do perhaps what we should be doing. And Peter addresses this fear to a group of Christians who were afraid once. And uh, here's what he told them. He said, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened. So we keep looking at Herod's story. Verse four says, assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And then this is what the prophet says. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. It's funny that they have to recite prophecy to the king of the Jews because, again, he's not Jewish, so he doesn't know these prophecies. Verse 7 says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So we already saw that Herod is afraid. And now we're going to learn that he's jealous. Herod was jealous. And as silly as it may sound, Herod is jealous of a baby, right? I mean, right now, Herod is king. Herod is king. He's on the throne. He's got the crown. He's got the title. This baby maybe might one day grow up to be king, but he'd be long gone by then. Why should he even care? Perhaps, but did these wealthy, astute, wise men come to see him? No. Come to worship him? Say good things about him? Give him gifts? No. Look, power does something to people when they get it. And rarely do they want to share it. And they never want to let it go. They would do anything to keep it. Saul, right? In the story of uh, King David and Saul, Saul was another very jealous leader. After David slew Goliath, even though he was only a teenager, David had no political power, no followers. Saul grew jealous of David because after he killed Goliath, everyone loved him. They sang songs about him. 1 Samuel 18, 9 says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Well, now Herod has a jealous eye on Jesus. Herod wanted the praise and the worship that was going to go to this baby. He wanted those gifts from the East. Verse 9 says, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, 
they departed to their own country by another way. I know we're talking about Herod right now, but can we just pause here at this moment and think about this passage? These men worship a baby, right? The Bible says they fell down. They prostrated themselves. They took a humble, submissive stature to a child. These men are wealthy. They are men of means who can make and afford to take a trip like this. They are learned. They are educated. They could have done anything they wanted to. And especially even in this moment, they could have done anything they wanted to. Nobody would have questioned it. They were foreigners. They're not Jewish. They were not even from any place nearby. They came all this way to worship a child. And just five miles away, Herod is worried. He's staring out the window. He's pacing. He's checking his phone. No missed calls. Where are those guys? He's so worried about controlling the story. And right now, the story is out of his hands. What are they doing? What are they talking about? Are they laughing? Are they, are they calling him names? What's so great about this kid? And, and, and what has this kid got that Herod hasn't got? Who do we identify with the most in the Christmas story? Verse 13 says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night, departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod, when he had seen that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under. Herod was afraid. Herod was jealous. If the wise men had returned and told him where the Christ child was, he would never have worshipped. He would never have submitted. Herod is only interested in what helps him, what advances him, what keeps him in power. And leaders like that, they don't care about the people they lead. They just wanna be in charge. They only want it if it helps them. You know, we can think about God like that sometimes. We can think about prayer and church like that. And we, we can say, you know, I'm only gonna to go to church if I need to. I'm only going to go if it works with my schedule. I'm only going to pray or, 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 or become involved in church if it helps me. But Christmas peace reminds us that it's about surrender. A baby who asks nothing of us. A baby who in that moment demanded nothing from us. And yet there were those who still felt the call to surrender. I bow down to the Christ child, not because it helps me, not because I'm told. The wise men, they bet on the right horse. God warned them in a dream to take a different route. Herod tried to be a trickster, but he couldn't outsmart the wise men. So once again, Herod bets on the wrong horse. So he tries one last Hail Mary. Herod asks for the nuclear football and he pushes the button. He kills every boy under two years of age. This is how twisted men think. If I can't have what I want, if I can't get the result I want, well, then I'm just going to make sure that everybody else suffers with me. If I have to be sad, then we're all going to be sad. My son hates this movie because of this scene, hates this type of Christmas movie, like the nativity. The nativity is a, a, a movie about the birth of Jesus, and it begins with soldiers running from house to house. 
This is the idea that children are slaughtered by a madman who cares only about his reputation and what people think of him, a man who only cares about his legacy, even at the cost of other people's lives. Herod the Great was a madman, and he was angry. Herod was angry. Herod was so filled with anger that he tried to hijack Christmas. Have you ever noticed that most Christmas movies, they only have one plot, right? Some evil force tries to put an end to Christmas, and then someone else has to save it. The Grinch tried to steal all the presents and all the food and all the decorations in Whoville, hoping that he could steal the joy of Christmas. Herod tries to steal Christmas. He's the original Grinch. Fortunately, Herod was not successful. An angel warns Joseph of what was going to happen. And Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they were able to escape to Egypt. They were out of Herod's reach. But many infants and toddlers were killed because of Herod's anger. Anger, if not controlled, can make us do horrible things. You know, before Benedict Arnold was a traitor, he was a loyal citizen of what would become the United States. He was a decorated soldier. He was a five-star general. He was wounded twice in battle, highly respected military leader. He was even a friend of George Washington. But during the Revolutionary War, he saw five soldiers beneath him advanced and promoted above him. And he couldn't take it got angry. He took revenge. In 1780, he was attempted to betray West Point to the British. And later, he even moved to England. He was paid a large sum of money for it. But because he was a traitor, he was never fully accepted into British society. And history says that he died a very unhappy man. Abraham Lincoln knew that his own anger could lead to disastrous events. So if he had to send a letter and berate someone or uh, let his emotions out, he would write two letters. He would write an angry letter first that was very insulting and had terrible words in it. He, he said all the bad things he wanted to say. He got all of that out of the system and then he would destroy that letter and he would write a second letter that was a little bit more tactful. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. And that same year, King Herod died. Matthew 2, 19 says, When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, King Herod the Great. King Herod the Great, the bloody ruler of ancient Judea, he died. Get this. I mean, this is, I couldn't have made this up. This is so laughable. He dies from a combination of chronic kidney disease and a rare infection that caused gangrene on his genitalia. And his last order, his last order from his deathbed was that all of the rich, famous, powerful people be locked up and thrown in prison. Yeah, for nothing, for no reason. Lock them up. And then he said, and when I die, when I breathe my last, I command my soldiers to go into the jails and to kill everyone in prison. To kill everyone in prison because... He wanted people to cry. He wanted there to be tears on the day that he died because he knew. He knew people would party. They would love to have him gone. They would love to be rid of him. They'd be dancing in the street. The people hated him. They would do anything to get rid of him. This is who we're dealing with. He's a madman, he's a tyrant. And he, and he once again bet on the wrong horse, right? When he died, the people defied his order. And instead, they released everyone from prison. Now, we call him Herod the Great. So he got his wish. He's famous. His story is written down. He's even acted out in plays. But history does not remember him the way he wanted. He is a footnote in somebody else's story. He's a B-list character. The story is not about him. He isn't Herod the Builder. 
Instead, he's the butcher, the murderer, the tyrant. He's the villain of the story. And the real hero of Christmas was five miles away. The true king of the Jews was a baby. And then 80 years later, everything Herod had built was gone. Nero was gone. The temple was gone. 80 years later, John the Apostle, who took Mary into his own home, John, who was an eyewitness to this entire story, John, who witnessed miracles, watched Jesus die, was at the empty tomb. John, now an old man, he sits down and he's able to summarize everything. And he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus wasn't just the king of the Jews. He came for everyone. He was the king for all. He was the king for humanity. And a great leader, a great leader doesn't bring a sword. A great leader doesn't bring division. A great leader does not bring confusion. In fact, as king and ruler, Jesus didn't even come to be waited on hand and foot. Herod would have had nothing to worry about because Jesus never pursued a throne. And the only crown he ever got was made of thorns. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, in the Christmas story, we have two very distinct kingdoms, the kingdom Herod tried to build and the kingdom Jesus tried to build. Herod tried to build a kingdom of his own rather than join Jesus' kingdom. Herod tried to make a name for himself rather than spending his life making Jesus' name great. And when our story is told, what do we want our story to be about? In John's Christmas story, he says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I know. I know what it looks like outside. I know it looks bleak outside. I know it looks hopeless outside. But the Bible says that evil has not overcome. You know, Joanna and I went to the store uh, to get Christmas lights for our tree this last weekend. On December 2nd, we went. December 2nd. We only needed one strand of lights. We just needed one measly little box. Uh, We had one burnt out strand on our tree. And on December 2nd, the tree lights were all sold out. On December 2nd. You know what that tells me? That tells me that all the things that make up Christmas like joy and hope and love and peace are winning. They're winning. People are unanimously waiting for hope and love and peace to return. They know that what comes with Christmas is going to allow them to win. They are pushing darkness aside as quickly as they can. But all the rest of the year long, if I'm honest, I probably act more like Herod and less like Jesus. I don't have peace in my life. I could blame the world. I could say it's the world's fault. I could say, oh, there's too much noise in the world. There's too many buttons. There's too many screens. There's too many lights and video. There's too much information. I can't drown it all out. And all of that clutter... Like, let's, let's just call it what it is. It's garbage. Right? It's all garbage. TV, the internet, all of it, it's garbage. All of that garbage makes me live fearfully. I'm worried all the time. I'm worried about letting my kids play one block away. 
I won't let my kids go anywhere on their own. I won't let them stay home alone. I'm afraid of getting sick, afraid of losing my job, afraid those two people that are whispering over there, they're talking about me. It's all garbage. All this world garbage then makes me live a fearful life and a jealous life. I become naturally insecure. I scroll endlessly through other people's pictures and I covet their happy lives and I covet their clean homes. I watch makeover shows and I wish my house was better, my car was newer, or I had a jet ski or a boat or an RV. I obsessively think about what my life would be like or what it should be like. And my fear and my jealousy make me paranoid. And I'm suspicious of everything. The school board, the CIA, the mayor's office, the government, everybody's crazy except me. So all that world garbage makes me angry. What makes me angry? Lots of things. Here's a list I found from author Doug Britton. What makes me angry? I'm driving and someone cuts in front of me. I'm driving and someone is a backseat driver. I'm a passenger and someone drives too slowly. I'm a passenger and someone takes a different route than I would. I'm a passenger and someone gets lost. I'm a passenger and someone puts in a different place than I would choose. My spouse lets the car run out of gas. My spouse doesn't load the dishwasher right. My spouse criticizes the way I load the dishwasher. My spouse weighs too much. My spouse is late getting ready for church. My spouse comes home late. My spouse spends too much money. My spouse forgets something I did. My spouse is clumsy or has an accident. My spouse complains or worries. My spouse or my children are noisy when I try to sleep. My children are disrespectful. My children fight. My boss makes stupid decisions. My people in my life are late. Somebody said a mean thing to me. Someone took advantage of me. Someone ignores me. Someone makes fun of me. Someone accuses me falsely. I think God treats me unfairly. I think I do more than my share. I am unappreciated. Someone broke a promise. Someone lied to me. I walk into our home and it's messy. We're out of milk. We're out of other items. Our TV broke. My favorite sports team lost. A politician did something wrong. I don't like this sermon. Is that how you want to live? Do you think that out of all the characters in the Christmas story, we would more closely identify with Herod? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Herod always bet on the wrong horse. Do you know who got it right? The wise men. And they were foreigners. They were not even Jewish and they got it right. They were in the presence of true love and they worshiped. They were in the presence of joy and they worshiped. They found true peace lying in a manger and they fell down on the ground and they worshiped. But you see, that's the beauty of worship. Suddenly you forget yourself and you allow yourself to submit. You raise up hands to your father in dependence. You sing loudly about his greatness. Listen, church is more than a sermon and it's more than an offering plate. This is where you come to worship. But I can be Herod even here in church, can't I? I can be afraid that other people don't like my singing. Other people don't want me to raise my hands. I can be jealous of somebody else's voice or somebody else's car, or I can be jealous of her dress or that guy's knowledge. I can be angry. They don't sing the songs I like. They don't cut the grass here at the church the way I like. The pastor touched a nerve with me today instead of what my true focus should be. Bowing down to the Christ child. Maybe, just maybe, if I can take more attention off of my kingdom and what I'm so worried about building and keeping instead of worrying about my legacy. And I spent more of my time worshiping and submitting and building Jesus' kingdom, maybe, just maybe my life would have more peace. What do you think?
1 Corinthians 14 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. You know, there's another scene. The Last Supper. Before Jesus goes to the cross, he spends a holiday dinner, right? It's a holiday meal. The biggest holiday of the year that everyone looked forward to. He sits down with his friends, family, people that were close to him, and he shares this meal. And even in that moment, there was one person who had bet on the wrong horse. There was one person, a man named Judas. He wasn't truly focused on Jesus. He wasn't interested in building Jesus' kingdom. He wasn't fully submitted. And in the moment, in the middle, right? In the middle of something so beautiful and so integral to our faith, like communion and the Last Supper, he, Judas, he's spinning his wheels trying to find the angle that benefited him. Instead of where his focus should have been, it was right there in the room with him, sitting across from him, speaking loving words to him, and he missed it. This Christmas, don't miss the baby. Amidst all the noise and clutter of the world and all the darkness that's going on outside, remember, peace has come. Jesus has already conquered that darkness. He has already brought peace. Christmas is the reminder that even though the world is dark and it makes us fearful and it makes us jealous and it makes us angry, God is not the God of confusion. He is the God of peace. This Christmas, I want you to surrender, to submit, to fall down at the manger, to fall down at the child, to realize that that that's the only thing that's important. You will find more joy and more love and more peace when you connect and worship and submit to him, when you build his kingdom and not your own. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for Christmas. We thank you for the joy and the love that it brings, the cheer, the tidings uh, that we extend to one another, but Lord, mostly the peace. This season, this month, this holiday, we are asking for peace, to shut the noise and the garbage that's outside, to turn the TV off, to shut down Facebook, to close the lid of our laptop, to put our cell phone away, and to focus on the only thing that's important, the only man in the room, the only king that I will ever submit to, the only king that I will ever bow down to, the only king that I will ever worship. Lord, may the Christ child be the focus, not just this month, but my life. I want Jesus to be the focus of my life, and I want to spend the rest of my life building his kingdom and submitting to his kingship worshiping his name and obeying him for the rest of my days. May Christmas be the gospel message that is on everyone's lips this season. Let us drown out the darkness with light. Let's shine our light so bright that darkness never returns. Thank you for your son, for his precious gift. Thank you for Christmas. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Remember, this is a, a link. It's a URL up there at the top. You can always clip and copy it. Post this sermon to your own social media wall. Send some joy and love and peace out there into the world, right? Send some goodness out there into the world. Or post the sermon on a friend's 
Facebook wall, post this to their social media, email it to them if you think they might benefit from it today. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Have a great week.